So here we are again, folks. Formula One has decided it's time for another revolutionary overhaul. The 2026 regulations promise smaller, lighter, more agile cars that will supposedly transform racing as we know it. For veterans who remember when engines could wake the dead from three time zones away, you know the drill. F1 creates a problem, ignores it for a decade, then presents a fix as a groundbreaking innovation. It's the cycle of life in this sport. For newcomers who just found F1 through Netflix, welcome to the beautiful unhinged madness. Whether you started watching during the Schumacher dominance or just discovered F1 through Netflix, these regulations will fundamentally change what you're watching come 2026. Let's dive into what's really changing and whether F1 is finally learning from its mistakes or just creating new ones with extra steps. Here's something that shouldn't be revolutionary, but apparently is. F1 has figured out that massive cars might not be ideal for close racing. Shocking revelation, truly. The 2026 cars shrink significantly. Wheelbase drops 200 millimeters to 3,400 millimeters. Width cuts 100 millimeters to 1,900 millimeters and floor width loses 150 millimeters. We're going from luxury yachts to large sedans. Still not nimble, but progress nonetheless. For veterans who remember when F1 cars looked like proper racing machines, these dimensions are still massive. The legendary MP4-4 had a wheelbase of just 2,875 millimeters, a little over 500 millimeters shorter than 2,026 cars. But at least we're moving towards sanity. The dimensional changes directly contribute to that massive 55% drag reduction from the active aero system. Smaller cars create less aerodynamic disruption, theoretically allowing following cars to stay closer. Current F1 cars are like driving behind moving walls. The 2026 machines should create cleaner wakes, making the grid feel slightly less congested. The minimum weight drops to 768 kilograms, a 30 kilogram reduction. This marks the first significant mandated weight cut in over two decades, deliberately reversing the trend of ever heavier machines. This is more than trimming fat. It's F1 admitting its cars became bloated beyond recognition. To understand why this matters, the legendary MP4-4 weighed around 540 kilograms. Current cars tip the scales at 800 kilograms, nearly 50% heavier than the machine that won 15 out of 16 races. We've added 260 kilograms over three decades while making cars longer, wider, and more complex. While this 30 kilogram cut moves us only from morbidly obese to merely overweight, it is genuine progress. It's high time if one's thoroughbred started looking like a racehorse again, not a Clydesdale. Every kilogram matters exponentially in racing. Lighter cars require less energy to accelerate, making that 8.5 megajoules of energy recovery per lap more efficient. The electrical systems become more effective when not fighting unnecessary mass. For drivers who've never experienced truly lightweight F1 cars, they're about to discover what they've been missing. The combination of less weight, shorter wheelbase, and narrower dimensions should create genuinely agile machines for the first time in decades, allowing them to truly feel the steering inputs again. While everyone obsesses over active aero, Pirelli is quietly being asked to perform miracles with rubber and physics. Front tires lose 25 millimeters, rears lose 30 millimeters. That's a significant reduction in contact patches. For anyone who understands grip, those are substantial changes. The 18 inch rims stay because apparently F1 learned not to change everything at once. Here's the real story. Narrower tires are crucial for achieving that 55% drag reduction. Wider tires are rotating walls that churn up air and make following cars miserable. By shrinking contact patches, F1 is trying to clean up the aerodynamic wake that's plagued close racing for decades. The question is whether Pirelli can maintain grip with less rubber while teams deal with 30% less downforce. That's asking a lot from tire chemistry. For veterans, narrower tires represent a return to sanity. There's something to be said for tires requiring skill rather than providing endless grip. Remember when drivers had to modulate throttle to avoid spinning? The narrower contact patches should bring back driver skill elements, engineered out of modern F1. The irony? F1 spent years making tires wider to improve spectacle. Now they're making them narrower for the same reason. It's a perfect example of F1 chasing its own tail. We'll see if the skill versus grip balance finally lands in the right place. Active aerodynamics, the feature that has purists reaching for blood pressure medication. But the numbers behind this system are either brilliant or insane, possibly both. The performance delta is staggering, enabling drivers to switch between a high down force cornering setup and a speed maximizing low drag configuration on command mid lap. Z mode is the default high down force setting, engaging the full capacity of the front and rear wings for maximum cornering grip. 
X mode instantly flattens the wings for straight line speed, creating essentially different race cars. The front wing gets a 100mm reduction, with a sophisticated flap design to reduce disruption for following cars. The rear wing's three element system allows complex airflow control in both modes. For those who remember when aerodynamics meant make it slippery and add wings, this feels like overcomplication. Fixed wings forced hard choices. Active aero lets teams have maximum downforce in corners and minimum drag on straights. Technically impressive, philosophically questionable. The reliability concern is real. More moving parts mean more failures. A DRS failure costs straight line speed. Active aero failure in wrong mode could cost entire aerodynamic balance. Imagine being stuck in X mode through Monaco or Z mode on Monza straights. The radical level of drag reduction could genuinely transform racing or just make everything more complicated. The heart of the 2026 revolution is the new power unit, which shifts the emphasis to electricity. The regulations mandate a near 50-50 power split between the traditional internal combustion engine, ICE, and the beefed-up electric motor generator unit Kinetic, MGUK. The old MGUH, the complex system that recovered energy from exhaust heat, is gone, supposedly simplifying things. Instead, all electrical energy is recovered through braking, MGUK, or generated directly by the engine. The override system replaces DRS entirely. When within one second of the car ahead, a driver can deploy an electric boost, delivering full power up to a higher speed than the car in front, allowing for a decisive overtaking opportunity. The controversy, the complexity didn't disappear. It just moved to energy management. A strict 8.5 megajoule harvesting limit per lap is in place, and engineers are already sounding alarms. The core problem is simple physics. Most circuits, like Spa or Silverstone, simply don't have enough heavy braking zones to consistently recover the required energy for a full lap. This has led to immediate talk about reducing the MGUK's maximum power output mid-race, a tacit admission that the 50-50 split might be fundamentally flawed and could force drivers into embarrassing economy runs on straights. Finally, the 100% sustainable fuel mandate aligns F1 with automotive trends and environmental goals. Whether racing should lead environmental initiatives or provide escape from them depends on your perspective and tolerance for motorsport virtue signaling. Here's where 2026 gets genuinely exciting. Major manufacturers are returning with serious money and ambition, validating F1's hybrid future. Audi isn't just participating, they're cannonballing into the deep end. Taking over Sauber and developing their own power unit represents massive commitment. They are betting motorsport credibility on F1's hybrid vision. That 350 kilowatt MGUK and 8.5 megajoules energy recovery directly translates to their EV development needs. Ford's partnership with Red Bull marks their return after decades away. Rather than starting from scratch, they're leveraging Red Bull's success while showcasing hybrid engineering capabilities. The Ford name carries serious motorsport heritage, adding manufacturer rivalry F1's been missing. Cadillac enters as the 11th team, initially using Ferrari power while developing their own engine for as early as 2028. This represents GM's renewed global motorsport commitment and F1's American expansion. The two-phase approach is strategically brilliant, immediate participation without massive upfront power unit investment. These entries create six power unit manufacturers, the most diverse engine competition in decades. Different approaches to the 50-50 split should drive innovation and create genuine performance differences. More suppliers means better deals and more competitive packages across the grid. For American fans, Ford and Cadillac provide genuine domestic connections beyond just drivers or races. It's American manufacturers with American engineering competing at the highest level. The manufacturer involvement provides regulatory stability. When automotive companies invest billions in specific technical regulations, those rules become harder to change arbitrarily. Of course, manufacturer F1 history is mixed Honda has left four times, BMW departed after winning championships. Toyota spent billions winning nothing. The difference this time might be direct road car relevance. The 2026 hybrid focus changes the justification equation significantly. The uncomfortable truth? Regulations rarely deliver exactly what they promise. F1 teams employ the smartest engineers on the planet, whose job is finding advantages within whatever rules exist. The 2022 ground effect regulations were supposed to improve following and overtaking. They helped but created new problems like porpoising. The 2026 changes address real issues. Cars too heavy, large, and difficult to follow. The solutions make sense on paper, but teams will optimize active aero in unimaginable ways. Offset weight reduction with performance-enhancing mass. And maximize narrower tires through boundary-pushing techniques. This is realism based on decades of F1 history. 
The regulations will change the sport, but probably not exactly as intended. For veteran fans who remember simpler, louder, arguably purer F1, these changes represent both progress and compromise. Cars will be more agile, with potentially better racing, but also more complex and further from mechanical purity that once defined the sport. For newer fans, 2026 represents witnessing genuine regulatory reset. You'll see team adaptation, driver adjustment, and competitive order reshuffling. The manufacturer entries alone make 2026 worth anticipating. Audi, Ford, and Cadillac bring fresh energy and resources that should elevate competition. Will these regulations solve F1's problems? Probably not entirely create new ones, almost certainly, change the sport meaningfully, absolutely. The 2026 season won't recreate the golden age older fans remember, nor satisfy everyone's F1 vision, but it represents genuine evolution in a sport struggling to balance tradition with progress. The cars will be smaller, lighter, and more complex. Racing should be closer and more strategic. The grid features new manufacturers with serious ambitions. It might not be the F1 of the past, but it could be the F1 the future demands. Is 2026 the revolution F1 needs, or just more of the usual beautiful madness? Like the video, comment below with your take on the new rules, and subscribe for more straight-shooting F1 analysis.